Hey everyone, just a quick housekeeping item before we get started today. The show is going to be moving to once monthly episodes again for the next few months. We have some exciting projects in the work that are going to take some resources to get off the ground. So we are moving the show to once a month for the time being and shows will still be on Thursdays. So you will have a new microbiome report every Thursday of each month. Welcome to the Microbiome Report powered by Biome Health. I'm your host, Andrea Ween, and I am talking with Stephen Fleming today for this mini episode on short chain fatty acids. If you're not familiar with that term, you may have heard about acetate or butyrate, which are two of the most widely discussed short chain fatty acids. Now, I met Stephen at a microbiome conference where he was the only one brave enough to sit in my hot seat and let me ask him questions about his business in front of the other attendees. Stephen is the founder of Traverse Science, and while he found his roots first in psychology and later as a neuroscientist at the University of Illinois, he now combines a passion for data science, tech transfer, and entrepreneurship to help accelerate research in the microbiome space. So short chain fatty acids, these are also called metabolites or postbiotics, and they are a very emerging area of science in the microbiome world. We've touched on them before, but they are really so important that we think that they warrant more talking about, and we will continue to talk about them. So this is just the beginning. On this show, we give a little background. We talk about what a short chain fatty acid is, what they do, the implications of them in the body and where they're found. Hint, it is not just in the gut. And we also talk about how exogenous and endogenous short chain fatty acids from fermentation are two very different things. Okay, let's get to it. Steven, welcome, welcome. Hello, I'm very happy to be here. Well, we're very happy to have you. So I think to set the stage, we have talked about short-chain fatty acids, also called metabolites, also called postbiotics. They have many names on the show in a number of different ways before, but we have never really taken a, a look at what these things are, where they're produced, what they do in the body. Can you give us just the lay of the land here? What is a short-chain fatty acid? Yeah, I am also or was also very confused by all those terms. Uh, people call them a lot of different things. So short chain fatty acids, I guess I'll try not to give the chemical definition, but some people call them organic acids. Other people call them volatile fatty acids. They are, as the name implies, actually, the name almost says exactly what it is. <laughs> it's a fatty acid with a short chain. So they have fewer than six carbons. They're predominantly found in the gut, you know, of humans and animals after fermenting things like fiber. They're, they're in the highest concentrations in the gut, but you can also find them in different parts of the body. And I first heard of them as being just called short chain fatty acids. They're in papers called SCFAs. Right now, there's a lot of, I, I don't know, when I first heard the term postbiotic, I was like, what is that? And I was like, oh, you're just talking about a short chain. So, okay, cool. But I think they're like postbiotic might be a, a broader umbrella category that um, short chains could include. There's a lot more than six, but most people only talk about six and, you know, even, even less than that, really just three. So the ones that most people throw around are, are acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Or, you know, they talk about them in their acid forms like acetic acid, butyric acid. And then we have three others that pop up in a lot of literature, too. And those are isovalerate, valerate, and isobutyrate. I just call the acetate, propionate, and butyrate like the big three. I don't think that's really caught on anywhere. Maybe no one does that but me. Um, and the others like the small three because they're also just in smaller concentrations in the colon. So my understanding of what these are We've kind of talked about them with some other guests on the show, too, as almost being the waste byproducts of our microbes. So it's the output of the microbes that are in our gut and in other places in the body. Is that an accurate way to think about it? Yeah, I feel like that's fair. They're the bacteria's poop, which <laughs> makes it sound bad. You know, a byproduct, right? So, you know, if we consume fiber, it's not going to be digested by our mammalian enzymes, but bacteria are going to gobble it up. They're going to digest it, absorb it, metabolize it. And, you know, they'll excrete a lot of different things and short chains are one of them. 
But, you know, actually, beyond being a waste product, though, too, there's cross-feeding between bacteria. So some bacteria, you know, will consume a short chain and use it as an energy source. So it's both, I guess it's bo- it, it can be both an input and an output. Just like dogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, so a quick tangent. Yeah, I worked in pigs in my PhD, and uh, I learned what coprophagy means, which maybe you guys have talked about, right? But it's when you're eating your own poop. And uh, I'm sure every dog owner knows that. So yeah. I guess bacteria practice that too. Okay. So specifically, this is bacteria that's doing this. Like these aren't coming from protozoa or fungi or any of the other viruses that might be hanging out somewhere in the body? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I think people only meet, the papers I read only really talk about them in how they relate to bacterial, bacterial fermentation, whether fungi do that or protozoa or others. I I don't think viruses would be capable of fermentation. So I, I, for the, for lay purposes, it's from bacteria. Okay. It's good to know. And then you mentioned that they're mostly in the gut, but they can be in other parts of the body. So now we're really starting to learn that each organ of the body, all the different systems has its own ecology and microbiome. Is that why we're finding these in other places, just not in as high of quantities? And I don't think it relates to like other organs having a microbiome or fermentation insights other than the gut. So what I researched a lot was on gut brain relationships. And I had my, my research questions were, for some reason, when we feed fiber or prebiotics, there's a benefit to cognition and mood. And I got on this thread of, you know, is it short chain fatty acids? So going into that, there's short chain, there's fermentation in the gut, you know, all, all along the gut, but usually highest, you know, after the end of the small intestine, the ileum right into, right into the colon. But, you know, there's absorption and I was kind of turned off immediately because they're like, no, there's really not going to be a lot of absorption. Usually, you know, the, the cells in the colon are going to, are going to gobble them up and they're just going to end there, but they do get absorbed. They, they travel um, through the portal vein to the liver, the liver will metabolize them further, but they, they are in circulation in small amounts. They can even be in, in brain tissue as well. You know, it's like the further you go, the lesser the concentration. So I think it's not as much about other organs or other sides of the body having a fermentative capacity. It's more so that they're originating in from the colon. That said, there's not a ton of studies on like tracing we fed something of fiber that was fermented. Those specific metabolites that originated from fermentation were absorbed and got to all these other places. But you could take samples of liver, bone, kidney, brain, blood, I think lung even, and you can find some concentration of, of some of these short chains. I think they do originate from the colon, but I'm not entirely sure. Is there also a question potentially of a leaky gut intestinal permeability standpoint where maybe they're actually not supposed to be in these other places and we find them there because there's some barrier integrity loss? Mm, Maybe is the short answer. Uh, Short chains, though, in a variety of barriers like the epithelial barrier as well as the blood brain barrier, they actually promote barrier integrity, right? So you you do want some things to pass, but not everything. And there have been studies where, you know, they look at like what are called tight junctions in in a barrier, like the intestinal barrier or the blood brain barrier. And those kind of help, you know, you either hear that called like permeability or integrity. And we, we typically want high integrity and high permeability means things are like, you know, ducking through, getting in between cells. At least if you look at in vitro evidence, Short chains should promote that. But to, I guess to your point, though, maybe you already, maybe you're, something already has a leaky gut and there should be absorption of these, but there isn't or, or they're exhibiting like paracellular diffusion. I would think that in pterocytes, they would especially be gobbling up butyrate. You know, maybe if there was an element of a leaky gut, they're not. At this point, if you can't tell, I'm speculating. So I, I don't know. That's the short <laughs> No, answer. that's fine. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? And I think it's very important for everyone. This is such a new area of research. The microbiome in general, relatively to science, is such a new area. And so everything we talk about on the show is always up for debate down the line, you know, always up for more theorizing and, and speculation. So 100%. that's a very important 
piece that we always like to remind people. Everything we talk about here is not written in stone fact. You know, this is how it is. So, right, yeah. so we did mention that this, we know that they can be good for barrier integrity. What else do they do in the body? What else are we starting to learn about these short chain fatty acids? Okay. Yeah. They do so many things. And this is where it gets a little bit murky and tricky because what we know about them, I think mostly comes from in vitro evidence, you know, meaning someone is studying cells isolated in a culture or from preclinical evidence from, you know, animal work. I did animal work myself, but I still try to be careful in terms of how much I interpret from that. So on a really simple level, you know, it's an acid, so it will lower the pH of, of the contents of the colon. They do act as a substrate for energy for colonocytes. Those are like really um, obvious and simple functions, I guess. There's others that I think are really interesting. So one is if you think about DNA and gene expression, like our, our DNA is, is tightly wrapped in this coil called chromatin. And in order to transcribe that, our, our enzymes need to get in there. And I kind of describe it like your DNA is like a scroll and it needs to be open to be read. And there are these proteins called histones that <laughs> may, that can help open or close that scroll. So essentially, some of these short chains will help that DNA stay in an open position, like an open scroll, so that it can be read and transcribed. So they can affect gene expression. And that can have this just downstream cascading effect on a lot of other things. We've talked about them promoting barrier stability or integrity and feeding other bacteria. I didn't know this, but okay, right. So acetate, acetic acid, if you ever had anything pickled, you're having, you're consuming acetate. And, you know, it's like if you have a bottle of white vinegar in your home, I don't know what it is, like 5% acetic acid. But anyways, I didn't know before that like drinking vinegars were this popular fad I wonder if it's coming back now, actually. Yeah, they for are. Wait, I mean, drinking for, vinegar, yeah. shrubs, like for <laughs> sure, that's all kind of back in vogue. I went to a new restaurant opening a couple of weeks ago and they had a shrub on the menu. It's like, huh, okay. They're, okay, they're really never heard of that making shrub. a comeback. What a is shrub that? is like a fermented vinegar flavored and then you add soda water to it. So it almost turns into like a healthy soda. I mean, a lot of them have a ton of sugar, which negates the benefit <laughs> yeah. of that. But it, you can make them at home, you know, with no sugar or minimal sugar just for fermentation. So, yeah, I don't know if I, how many whiskey old fashions I can have with like <laughs> vinegar bitters and still get these <laughs> helpful effects. But, okay, so on that point then, they can stimulate fatty acid oxidation, inhibit lipolysis. I wrote a blog and I'm literally just reading off of it right yeah, now. Yeah, no, we're going to um, link to it because that was what drew me to talking to you about this. And so we'll link to yeah. that in our show notes definitely at, at biomehealth.com slash pages slash podcast. But it's really tricky, though, because we, you know, have looked into this and I don't know, it's such a annoying fallback to say, oh, we don't know, we have to do more research. But there's all these dose effects. And, you know, we do have, I think, some good theoretical evidence that uh, some short chain fatty acids act on what are called G protein coupled receptors, which, you know, can have a variety of effects in different tissues. But to have like an overall effect that I guess people would say is good, would promote like something like weight loss. But to me, it seems like remain to be seen. How much of that activity do they actually have? How much vinegar would you actually have to consume to do that? It's really interesting to me on, a, on like a cellular and molecular side. But does that just get washed out by so many other things happening? You know, how how strong is that effect? And that's, that's where I guess I kind of step back and be a little bit more skeptical when, you know, someone's talking about, hey, we have this prebiotic or probiotic or postbiotic and it does all these things. It's like, I feel confused and I'm in this space. So I'm just wondering how we even know some of these claims are true. If you've ever thought about getting your gut tested and stopped yourself because it's either too expensive, too inconvenient, or you're not sure about its accuracy, listen up. Viome has recently launched guttesting.com. This is a website where you can go and get gut results in under two minutes for free. Let me just repeat that. You can get a good sense of where your gut health is for free in two minutes. 
Now, how is this possible? As you might know, Biome has a gut test where you can go, send in your stool sample, and get the contents of your microbiome back. They also ask a series of questions when you send in your stool sample. And what the brilliant minds on the data side have figured out is that they can fairly accurately predict if someone is gonna have gut imbalance or gut dysbiosis or be in balance based on how they answer these questions. So they've made these questions available to you to be able to analyze your gut for free in under two minutes. Go to guttesting.com, G-U-T-T-E-S-T-I-N-G.com. No strings attached. Get your gut analyzed under two minutes for free. You're welcome. There's a couple different things. Like when you were just talking about the drinking vinegars, you know, is there a tie to – oftentimes I'll have a client drink like apple cider vinegar or some type of bitters to boost digestion, right, to boost the actual hydrochloric acid. And mm. so is there a tie then with like the acidity of the stomach and the food that's moving through the digestive tract that actually ends up triggering not only the enzymes to be released from the pancreas but also some type of chemical reaction with the microbes that have them spit out more short-chain fatty acids. Again, complete speculation, right? But is there something there or is that acetate in the vinegar feeding more of the bacteria that are then having that reaction? So there's so many schools of thought to kind of go down. I think one of the biggest ones, when I started learning about these, one of my biggest questions was, okay, it's the end product of a bacterial waste product, basically. But why can't we just, why can't we just supplement with that then? (laughs) Right? Why can't we just like skip that step and just supplement with those? Do we have a good answer for that yet? Uh, Okay. I have a half answer to that. Well, I think you could just supplement with them, but you might get a different effect. So this is where um, okay, so I did my research at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and I did it in the animal science program. First off, I'm just like a suburban kid. I don't know anything about like farming, but I did my research on a research farm in pigs. And through that, I just learned a lot about animal science and agriculture and livestock. And okay, so on that on that side, well, first off, people who study you know, dairy and beef, like ruminants, they know so much about this. And it's like the human researchers are like just starting to learn about it. And they're like, this is old news, we're bored. So they have used, this is where some people call them more like organic acids. And I initially thought, you know, isn't the stomach pretty good at regulating its own pH, but you can feed organic acids to pigs, and it helps keep the pH lower. And in that sense, it is more efficient in the sense of the stomach doesn't have to put as much work into regulating that pH because the food stuff or the feed stuff going in already has a low pH. And so livestock producers were looking into, okay, what type of acids could we add to feed, typically at very low levels, so that one, they would have a bacteriostatic or bactericidal, think of like salmonella in terms of like reducing salmonella outbreaks. So you could add these, I guess what, a lot of us call postbiotics into the feed for animals. And that would actually help reduce the incidence of pathogenic bacteria. It would help improve their feed efficiency. Like how much weight do they gain for amount of food going in? But a lot of the reason is like things that happen way before the colon or the gut or fermentation, you know, it's promoting gastric digestion. I think maybe, maybe an argument could be made for lessening the amount of bacteria in the small intestine. You know, we know they're there. We not we may not want a ton of them in there. This is the super long winded way of answering your question. So like I I guess <laughs> yes. I uh, you you could supplement with them. I think you're going to get a really different action. To make this even more long winded, <laughs> more long windeder, what the research I was doing, we were feeding pigs prebiotics and uh, looking at brain development. So this was in context of there's a lot of uh, what are called oligosaccharides in human milk that are seemingly special and in really high concentrations, but they're not an infant formula. So if we add them to formula, is you know, is that a good thing? Should we be doing that? So I would feed pigs these milk replacers that that did or did not have those prebiotics. You know, okay, so they go through the small intestine, pretty much undigested. They get to the large intestine, all the bacteria can feed on them. Yay! They should be producing short chain fatty acids. And what I ended up looking at is I was I would then correlate, okay, well, how much short chain fatty acid do they have in their gut and and how well do these animals perform on behavioral tasks? 
And what I found, is, this is in my dissertation, which if you just search like Stephen Fleming UIUC dissertation, you can download it there. Um, but what I found is that the location of the short chains was important. So humans don't have a cecum, but pigs do and, and a lot of animals do. So food, you know, we eat it, it goes to our stomach, that goes into our small intestine, duodenum, jejunum, ileum. Then it goes from the small intestine to the large intestine through the ileocecal junction. If you're an animal, sorry, if you're like a, a non-ruminant, like a pig, it's going to go into the cecum and there's tons of fermentation there. And then that food progresses through the ascending colon. They have a thing called the spiral colon, uh, descending colon, rectum and out. And so when you start closer to the in, the small intestine, you have lots of fermentation. I'm still talking about in the colon, sorry, the large intestine. Mm -hmm. But as you get closer to the rectum, you have less and less fermentation because usually, you know, the substrate has been fermented already. So with that set the stage there, I looked at a couple different regions like the cecum, the ascending colon and the descending colon. And in the cecum and the descending colon, so you could almost capture that as like the start and the end of the colon, I found that these hardly related to behavior at all, the, these, the concentration of these short chains. But it was relevant in the ascending colon, which is kind of like more of a middle portion. I thought that was really interesting and weird that maybe there's this local relationship where it's important in a specific part of the colon. I looked into... Has have other people found this? And I didn't find a ton. There's probably more now, you know, since I, I did that work. But, you know, there there had been some people showing that you can alter behavior of like mice and horses by injecting them with propionate. In like the context of those papers, that was viewed as a bad mm, thing. But injection, that's, a, that's bypassing digestion altogether. Oh, so that becomes a, a whole nother. Yeah, okay, yes. This is the whole other part too. And I've I've heard this is like a... I've heard of fermentation being related to autism a lot too. And there's some animal work where they, what they do is they make a cranial window, which is basically like you, <laughs> this sounds so barbaric. You cut a like hole in the brain. People, yeah. <laughs> brain barrier. You cut a hole in the skull and yeah. then you, you can do like a bath application of, you know, a drug or whatever it is. People have done that with these and they're like, look, behavior is bad. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> you just like put this stuff directly in the brain. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's relevant. Yeah. But oh, humans. I, yeah. <laughs> I think there is a local, absolutely a local action that short chains are doing. And, and with respect to the brain, to, to argue that these things are being absorbed and they get through, they get through the portal vein, they get through the liver, they get all the way to the brain, past the blood brain barrier. By the way, the blood brain barrier, you now get in that you, you have astrocytes, which interface between neurons and the blood. There, there's so many steps to make a claim that they have a direct effect on a distant organ. Whereas the brain also has the vagus nerve, you know, that innervates so many different organs, but it also innervates the gut. It innervates the colon. And I'm super curious. This is now I'm in unfounded territory. I, I'm super curious to see if the vagus nerve is, is sensing metabolites like short chain fatty acids. And, and the vagus nerve itself, it doesn't just like have like nerve endings freely in the colon hanging out. There's a you know, couple pieces of tissue between those. But I, I just, I really feel strongly that there is a connection with the vagus nerve. We, we know from other people's research that if you feed a pre or a probiotic, but that vagus nerve is severed, you, you don't get as beneficial of an effect. So, of course, all these things are happening at the same time. There's probably some absorption and direct effect on organs at the same time as the vagus nerve might be sensing these and in some way relaying that information to the brain, which could then have some sort of behavioral effect. I'm um, thinking so, too, like yeah. what if there's a critical mass of short chain fatty acid, like when you hit X number, Ooh. that Ooh. then it's triggering some production of hormone or neurotransmitter that that's getting picked up by the vagus nerve. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, like something maybe concentration dependent or yeah. or both concentration and, and duration dependent. I have I have low hopes that that will be figured out because it's extremely – difficult and tricky to record um, from neurons and then do it in like a controlled fashion when you're providing. Like there's definitely labs that can do it. They're just the minority of, of labs. Well, and I do think too, 
and this is no knock on science because obviously this whole show is about that and and we <laughs> love the scientific process, but things are often overlooked. I think specifically of Dr. Ghanoum's work and for years, no one, I mean, for 30 years, 25, 30 years, no one wanted to look at fungi as a contributor in the microbiome. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he was kind of beating that drum for a long time before he was ever able to get funding. And so you wonder, you know, who's out there that's maybe doing some ancillary research on this that's just not getting funding or not getting visibility. And what are we missing right now that will have yeah. very large impacts in the future? Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Um, and it's, of course, like with that, I don't know anything about the mycobiome and, and fungi, but presumably they're in a, a lower amount in the gut, right? And just with everything, we always just have this tendency to be like, well, there's less of them, who cares? Um, yeah. And we want more. And and that's where, like I was talking to you before about, about flux. And in a lot of studies, especially human, you're, you're just limited by what you can do. You know, you can get a fecal sample. You could probably, um, with uh, willing participants, use a probe to get something further up in the colon. But, you know, way fewer participants are going to want to do that. So it's you have a recruiting issue. With animals, you know, we're a lot of the times collecting collecting organ tissue, and we can look at what happens throughout that. But still, it's just this static snapshot in time. So if you are trying to make the argument that we want more short chains, okay, well, why are they? Why is there more there? Because there could be more because nothing else is absorbing it. And that's a problem. It could be more because there's this abnormal production so you know we have how much fermentation is going on how much absorption is going on what about cross feeding and i i don't know how to appropriately answer these things without super complex experimental designs but to just say you know i i guess i i see papers that say like oh these bacteria increased or decreased and they're they're butyrate producers it's like that tells you nothing and in those same papers, you can see that people are saying we want to increase these butyrate producers because butyrate apparently does all these good things. In that same paper, they then measure short chains and they're like, well, there was no difference between them. And, you, you know, you can, of course, go through the math in your in your mind of like, OK, well, if we had increased production, but also increased absorption, that might make it look like nothing actually changed. You would still be left with the same number. And that's kind of the problem with these static numbers which i mean we're just all limited by that so it's kind of like a a wimpy answer to say oh it's more complicated than that Uh, but to your original point like yeah a lot of this stuff is really overlooked there is you know people are researching this in livestock animals like poultry and swine probably don't care as much about what human people are researching and vice versa i really subscribe a lot more to like the one health or, or just that like we should be interpreting this with all available sources, not just human work. And I I feel like maybe I've, in my head, I've bashed animal research a little bit, even though I came from there because everything is so controlled. And then you get to the human and I feel like all bets are off. You know, that animal research is great to figure out the methods. Um, But, you know, we're all in our own silos and it's like we could really learn a lot. And I haven't even talked about like companion animal nutrition either. So I feel like the answers are out there, but it's it's also just like information overload. You know, there's just right. so many so many papers on this. I'm yeah. almost like I have microbiome fatigue. I don't want to see another paper with microbiome <laughs> in it. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that there's going to be a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, from myself anyway too. Like we're we're doing it too. So, so you had mentioned I had asked you for some talking points on this, and you had brought up exogenous and endogenous short-chain fatty acids from fermentation and how those are two different things. So I want to get into that a bit, but I think first we need to just define the terms exogenous and endogenous for people. Yeah. I I think we sort of got into that a little bit already, but I just mean exogenous as it came from outside the body. So like fermented food, right? If you eat a pickle, that is, that was exogenous to you. And what I, what I meant by endogenous is I meant that those fermentative metabolites, those short chains came from the fermentation of something in the body. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could keep running with this pickle analogy. Like if you eat a pickle and it's pickled, so there's acetate in there. Actually, I think this is going to backfire on me. Let's, something <laughs> else. Um, let's just pick a fiber, psyllium husk or, or something like that. 
Um, there's really not a lot, or, or I don't think any short chains that are that are present in that ingredient. But once it's fermented, there are short chains there. I would consider those endogenous. And then if you had drinking vinegar or something like that, I would consider that exogenous. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. So I always like to ask this question to kind of wrap up because I think you're the one that's done the research. You're the one that's looked at the studies. How have you changed or not changed your behavior based on what you've learned around short chain fatty acids? Oh, man, I'm the worst. I haven't changed at all. I had someone ask this to me, too, because they said, why is it that all these nutrition professors are out of shape? Do they not believe in their own research? And and it was an argument with another grad student. They're like, I feel like your whole field is bunk because if you guys believed in your research, you should all be super fit. <laughs> right. It's like going well to the dermatologist the with bad skin. You're like, why should I trust you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. You know, okay, on the simplest level, I, I know what they are now. And uh, oh, I guess I did used to be like, I don't want to go to that aisle with the laxatives because then people are going to think something's wrong with me. There's, <laughs> de- you know, maybe a stigma like that. And now it's like, no, nah, this stuff is totally normal. Maybe I'm more exploratory in in foods or supplements, but I'm also trying to be a lot more critical. Like if I if I see a supplement and they've got some wild claims on there, I'm it's like, all right, what's going on here? What are you, what are you trying to sell to me? But then on the reverse, if it's just, if like nothing is said about it, it's like, why, what's, what's the benefit of this? Right. Um, To your point earlier, like it doesn't necessarily behoove us to be increasing these for the sake of just increasing them because we don't actually know if that's good or bad, like what levers that will pull. And so it's, really, you know, so boring. We always talk, just go back to the basics, like eat a diverse range of foods, make sure you're getting an adequate amount of fiber, stay hydrated, you know, everything kind of in moderation rule. I am not a dietitian, so I will make zero recommendations. I did learn that anyone can call themselves a nutritionist though. I thought that was interesting. I It depends I, on the state, I will say. I, oh, There's some okay. rules around that's states, just, but yes. Yeah. Well, that's, I guess it's good that there's some <laughs> rules in place. I, I did my bachelor's in psychology, so I always come back to the behavior aspect of it. And I know personally, when I try to change everything at once, I fail at all of them. You know, if I'm trying to exercise more, eat better, and get on a sleep schedule, it's just overwhelming to me. So, you know, small habits add up. And like, those are the types of recommendations I would make rather than like, you should eat this or that. Just like, I feel like a lot of us know we shouldn't be eating things sometimes. There's, of course, scientific debate on like how much of XYZ macronutrient should we have. But, you know, there were times in grad school where I'm like, I could probably have less McDonald's. And I think it's fairly safe to say it would be good to have. Yeah, I think there was a whole documentary on that. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, maybe, maybe some some guy named Morgan. I don't know. All right. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for hopping on with us. This has been great. Of course, this will be a developing area of research. So as much as you don't want to see the research, it will be coming out. So (laughs) maybe we'll have you back on as things progress and we know a little bit more. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks for listening to check out the show notes for this episode, including a link to Stephen's article on short chain fatty acids for Traverse Science. Visit our show notes at biomehealth.com slash pages slash podcast. Don't forget biome is B-I-O-H-M. You'll also find a link to the show notes in the description for this show. The microbiome report is powered by Biome Health. If you have an idea for an episode or just want to send me a note, you can find me on Instagram at Dre Eats, D-R-E Eats, and by email at the microbiome report at biomehealth.com. I'm Andrea Ween, and I will catch you next time.